Hi, I'm Aubrey Ruby, and I'm a senior fellow at the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event today. So let me say good afternoon, good morning to all of those joining for all over the world for this important discussion of the future of institutional investment in African markets. Um, 2021 looked to be a banner year uh, for private investment and capital flows into African markets, hitting a record of over $7 billion. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of that was in the venture space uh, with over 54% of it coming uh, to fund African startups. But we also saw about 20% of it in private equity and only 3% in private equity or private debt funds. Um, and so what we see is an interesting structure for African capital flows, unlike what you would see in other regions. Plus 2022 has now brought an incredible challenge to that uh, with the downturn in the markets, uh, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Many of these things are having an impact on uh, capital flows into African markets. So one of the important discussion points today is really an outlook for what the opportunity set is, what the challenge set is, and how we all can work together as stakeholders in uh, Africa's kind of connections with the world uh, to build these relationships. So it's my pleasure to uh, host a panel, but first I wanted to turn to Yabsira Zaudi, who is the Associate Director of MEDA Advisors. Because MEDA, supported by USAID, has been leading investor trips to African markets. And Yipsir just came back from a trip with a group of institutional investors, so US pension funds, endowments, um, and other asset managers, uh, to both Senegal and to Kenya. And so Yipsir, tell us a little bit about this effort and what your trip yielded. Thank you so much, Aubrey, and thank you for the Tante Council for really championing the Africa agenda and for, for collaborating with us to create this platform to discuss international investment in African markets. Uh, MIDA, like you said, Aubrey, through USAID and Prosper Africa support have been supporting the enabling environment for US and African international investors to invest in the continent since 2017. We support the enabling environment. When I say that, we support it through education that is trustee to trustee cost education, building up capacity to access mutually beneficial investments with US and African institutional investors, um, leveraging African Amer American financial sector expertise to create transparent capital markets and empower local intermediaries, and also building relationships to further strengthen ties with African institutional investors and African focused managers. And by way of that, exploring investment and trade opportunities. So U.S. institutional investor delegation trips, like you mentioned, that we just got back from, has been uh, in South Africa in March 2017, and in 2018, Senegal and South Africa, and in 2019, uh, we've been to Kenya. And most recently, uh, the one we just came back from, Senegal um, and Kenya, back in April 2022. So these have been the largest ever assembled delegations of U.S. asset owners and fund managers to visit Sub-Saharan Africa to receive direct exposure to local markets and investment opportunities in private equity and infrastructure. As a result of these connections, USAID and MEDA have helped mobilize over $1 billion in investments flowing in both directions over the past five years. And this represents a significant accomplishment in USAID's initiative to identify and facilitate investment opportunities for U.S. institutional investors alongside African institutional capital and Africa's key sectors um, and enterprises. This work is closely aligned with US government's Prosper Africa's initiative to increase trade and investment between African nations and the United States. So we're very, very happy to be here with you on our panels. Uh, you, we will have our delegates, uh, some of our delegates were with us in Kenya and Senegal just recently to really share their perspective, which has been an unparalleled experience to be on the ground experiencing the continent and its real opportunities, real returns, real investments, uh, and uh, the way we explored risks, perceived risk versus real risks uh, during our stay. So happy to be part of this conversation and thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Yabzira. So just a couple questions on, on the delegation and structure. Part of MEDA's work also is to bring together uh, African institutional investors, um, put the, you know, helping build associations, et cetera, and connecting 
African pension funds with US pension funds and that trustee to trustee learning platform that you talked about. So could you speak a little bit to that part of the work and trip as well? Yes, um, like I mentioned, it, it's two way, uh, right? It's, it's, only, it's not only exposing US institutional investors to the opportunities on the continent, but also building the bridge between their um, uh, counterparts uh, on the continent. So we've been supporting through USAID support um, a consortium of pension funds in Kenya, for example, we, CAPFIC, and in South Africa, the Asset Owners Forum South Africa, for the pension funds um, on, on those regions to come together, pool assets, and invest. Because most of the time, as you know, their ticket size that they can allocate is very small, but they can come yeah. together and um, co-invest. And we've also seen tremendous results and milestones being achieved by U.S. institutional investors and co-investing alongside African institutional investors that way. So we've been supporting local pension funds as well, supporting capacity, advising on manager selection, and so on to really increase their capacity. And these delegation trips have really brought them very, very closely to share experiences, lessons learned with their U.S. counterparts. And are these annual? Will like our listeners, our participants today, you know, get an opportunity if they are institutional investors to go on future ones? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was just saying, are these trips annual? Do you plan on uh, having them every year? Because many of our audience might want to participate in some way in the future. Of course, um, these are, we usually um, have two a year. Um, we have one coming up in August to South Africa. We will have U.S. institutional investors from here and also other financial uh, professionals joining us on that trip. Uh, and we will be exploring um, additional uh, delegation trips going forward in the coming years. This is very, very essential to really support the enabling environment, like I said. Um, and the education is very key in exploring and also cultivating champions who've come back from these delegation trips and be champions here to educate and expose their peers um, in the U.S. institutional investment society uh, to really the real opportunities on the continent and what they've seen of the development and the real re returns, the possibilities. Well, excellent. I think that's a good introduction to our panel. And I'd like to welcome our panelists taking time out of their busy days to join us today to talk about their experiences. Um, so maybe I'll turn first to Rhonda Smith, who's a trustee at the Houston Municipal Retirement System. And Rhonda, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you sit, and you know, did you be, were you a part of this trip? And if so, why did you go? And, and what were your kind of takeaways? Hello, and thank you for the invitation to join the panel. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So my name is Rhonda Smith, and I'm actually a trustee for the Houston Municipal Employees Pension System, which is about a $4.1 billion pension system for the city of Houston. So if Houston is unique, we have three different municipal employee uh, systems, police, fire, and then municipal workers. And so I'm also a new trustee, as well as I am the secretary of the board. We tend to be very progressive in the way we uh, invest, including private equity. But what we haven't done is in, in looking at emerging markets and investing in private equity. So I was excited to be invited to be a part of this um, invitation to attend uh, the uh, Mita entourage and go to a couple of countries in Africa because it was actually my first visit to the country. And it was an introduction to investments outside of what we typically uh, do in investments. Uh, so we tend to be very consistent in what we do. So bringing on new opportunities is, is something that we are now looking at. And so this is one of the times. Well, you know, in my advisory career, I've worked the last 20 years trying to facilitate U.S. investment into African markets. And I've always really seen maybe three or four major obstacles to getting the money to move. And one is often a lack of data, right, data on the opportunities, because that when you don't have the data, risk and perceived risk can get all muddled together. Number, you know, number two is a lack of network. You don't know who to, to work with or, or which managers or you can't find ones or there's just a disconnect. Um, number three is structural, which uh, Yabsira mentioned, which is, you know, you have a, uh, you work with a $4 billion fund. I mean, rather like what's the average size of investment when you invest in a fund? 
So for the average size for a private equity, we're usually looking at 25, 30 million. To 30 million dollars. 30 million. So that's yeah, and many answer. African funds are not big enough because some of them have concentration requirements where you, you can be more than, say, like 20% of your fund, which I know is a New York common uh, uh, restriction. So you need larger vehicles often than, than sometimes can happen, but there's been some innovation in that space. And lastly, a visibility constraint. You can't invest in things you can't see. And so that's why our work on this type of event and, and the trip really helps. So, I mean, Eric, I'd like to bring you in here. Eric Newman is the treasury manager of the city of Samford. And, and Eric, uh, to hear a little bit from you on your vision and views of the trip before going and then maybe after. Sure, sure. A little bit more about myself besides sure. serving as a treasury manager. I serve as a trustee on several of our pension plans. The city of Stanford has five different pension plans. Our governance structure is we have five different boards. We operate through consultants or OCIOs, which each board dick, you know, hires, and then each one has their own investment policy. Allocations range across the board where we have some of our plans will be in private equity, emerging markets, while others have limited or no exposure to emerging markets or private equity. Um, I also serve on the town of Fairfield, also in Connecticut pension board, same thing. We have a joint investment board. Um, over there, we have 360, uh, 300, uh, $640 million of assets under management and combined in the city of Stanford, we have 1.1 billion, but then it's obviously split up over five different plans. So even our, our investments tends to get diluted because we're not making as big of an investment as mm -hmm. into things than we could if we were operating as more of a joint investment board structure. Um, looking at the outlook, you know, when I, you know, it was very educational for me. Um, First time and have to, your plans have your plans invested in Africa or emerging markets before? We've been in emerging markets. We um and with we tend, we invest in primarily funds, so emerging market funds. We do have uh, some separate managed accounts with portfolio managers, you know, on our international uh, equity manager or debt manager. When you go through it, uh, there's going to be very little Af African investments, and, and it's going to be very large publicly traded. Uh, either ADRs on the New York Stock Exchange, it's going to be a South African mining company, or it might be a, a energy company. So we're not necessarily gain. We're not. We don't have the exposure directly into the private equity or the more the emerging managers of that are coming out of of the African continent. And so you were saying you this was eye opening. It was your first trip as well. It was my first trip to the continent. Obviously, it's the two different countries. Um, going in, you know. Tell somebody where I'm doing, and it and I got two reactions. That's a great opportunity, and I get other opportunity. And other people say, "Are you crazy?" You know, mm -hmm. it's that perception. Um, and I'm glad I, you know, I'm glad I went 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 forward. Uh, and and really, once you land land in the country, you know, you land in an airport, you don't know what to expect. And then, you know, you learn very quickly, it's just like everywhere else. Um, you know, every every country. Every place on the continent has has the good and the bad, the challenges and the and the good stuff. So and and that perception was quickly eliminated. Um, and, and when I've gone back and and you tell a lot of people, it's like not what you what we all probably perceived. Um, and and what we don't in the media, the media definitely has paints a paint a picture that's probably not not positive at times when and they and they and a lot of times people will. Will incorrectly call Africa a country, and and it's really 54 countries made up of a con on the continent, and and you have different regions, you have different different areas, and everything is very different. Um, I guess you know we we always I guess a lot of times institution U.S. institutional investors take have this home bias, which is also challenging when you're trying to move move the needle, make allocations internationally into emerging markets, and further down the line, uh, frontier markets. Absolutely. Uh, Safiso, I mean, I want to bring you here. Uh, Safiso Sabia is head of investments at the Government Employee Pension Fund. Um, speaking more from an African institutional investor side, uh, you've been involved with uh, MEDA in the past and engaging uh, transatlantically with uh, other asset managers. What are some of your thoughts on the obstacles to getting more capital to flow? Um, thank you. Um, my name is Fiso Sbia. I'm from the Government Employees Pension Fund of South Africa. 
Um, our fund is around uh, 1.2 million active members. Uh, we have around uh, 500,000 pensioners. Um, the GPF is the largest uh, pension fund on the continent. We have about 150 billion USD, a 2.2 trillion um, SAR in terms of uh, RAND value assets under management. So um, I'm not entirely, uh, I, I can't necessarily speak for, 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 for the more international investors, um, but in terms of South, uh, uh, the GPF, we have had a very strong home side bias. Yeah. Around 85% um, of our AUM in total is actually invested um, in South Africa. Um, we target around 5% um, in terms of our AUM and the rest of the continent in terms of investing. So you have at least 90% of our AUM invested in the continent. So I'd say probably the biggest obstacle, if, it, uh, if I were to call it that, would be the gap between perceived and actual re re risk, right? So um, we're not denying that uh, the, the risk side of it, there are uh, risks on the ground, but um, on the other side of that, there's opportunities, right? Um, and uh, our, from our strategy, having a strong home side bias, we've benefited significantly um, from that. Um, our funding level has remained above 100%. Um, at our late, latest valuation, we are sitting at around 110% in terms of uh, our funding level. So we've had opportunities. Um, and um, another testament to that is if you look at South African government bonds, for example, they've been um, offering probably one of the most attractive yields um, um, overall for the past three years. So, uh, and when you look at it from a risk adjusted perspective, um, they, it's, 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 it's a no brainer in terms of investment. So I'd say the biggest uh, obstacle from a, a non-African investor point of view is probably more on the perceived risk side of things. Understood. Yeah, I mean that has always been a, an issue with how, uh, getting uh, American entities to invest in the region is is trying to to right size risk uh, and then mitigation. Um, I want to come back to Rhonda and Eric about what kind of opportunities and asset classes are you looking at. I know Rhonda, you mentioned private equity, um, but are you looking at infrastructure as well? Why? Why not? And I, before that, I want to encourage our audience to ask questions in the chat. Um, I will weave them in as we go because we want to have an interactive conversation here, uh, not wait till the end. Uh, I see many friends and many, many investors uh, in the participant list. So feel free to ask questions and we'll weave them in. So first, Rhonda, what kind of asset classes will the, your fund look at and, and what kind of opportunities are most exciting that you saw on the trip? So I mentioned private equity because that's what I found to be more exciting on the trip. Uh, so we tend to have about 30% of our assets in the global equity uh, stock market and then another 10 in fixed income. But we do a significant amount, about 17% in, um, asset, in, in private equity, as well as now we have a new one called, uh, a new one for us, and it's called uh, private debt. And so that is something that we're feeling now. So as I was there, I, I, I was thinking, is this within the debt category or is this within the private equity or real estate? So those are things that we are now looking at doing, but it's definitely something we would probably consider to be emerging markets, emerging managers, and really just educating our, our uh, trustees as well as consultants, because for US, Consultants are a significant part of what we do. We, we get their buy-in uh, and they provide all of the due diligence. So for us, I see more of private equity uh, in infrastructure for the city of Houston is a relatively new concept. In, we tend to do a lot of energy. Uh, yeah. this, this us, we do you know it well. real estate. <laughs> and so now we're looking at infrastructure and infrastructure has grown over the years and so Infrastructure and private equity is where I see more of an end easily to the international market in reference to what we call frontier. And it's really not frontier, international market. Yeah, what is exciting is an emergence of some private debt. I have long time believed that that is a major opportunity in African markets, and there haven't been as many private debt funds historically. 
Um, now some of the DFIs like CDC are backing a few, um, perhaps IFC as well, uh, to get that asset class moving because it can deliver really regular and predictable returns like you need for a, a pension fund. Eric, what about the city of Stanford? Um, what, uh, what kind of asset classes do you invest in and, and what did you find interesting? So we, we, we invest across the board, uh, harvest the debt structures because we need the current income to make payments to retirees. It also is the baluster to the, the equity portion of our portfolio. Uh, the private equity is obviously for a longer term growth because um, you have your J curves and uh, you're making your investment, you're not going to start getting return, significant returns a number of years out. Um, and during that period of time is always a challenge because you know we see the investment going in. We, if it's a uh, new 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 investments going in it takes time before you get those distributions and when you're yeah. comparing it to other parts of the portfolio which is very liquid like the public our public equity where it's always priced daily you're getting a lag on on your private equity valuations and it can be up to a quarter lag at times so so while it at one hand it, it benefits because you're not dealing with the volatility that you're you might be experiencing in the current market with the with the constant ups and downs and big drops, you know, we're, we're seeing our, our private equity and, and our credit stuff more stabilized. But, you know, when you look at risk, you know, you can't just assume that, you know, even U.S. Treasuries is not even, you know, traditionally a risk-free investment perceived. Yet, if you're, if you're in U.S. Equity, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds or any government bonds at uh, long duration right now, chances are you're going to be experiencing, you know, some, some unrealized losses just due to the recent rate increases. Both in domestically and internationally, as as many as as we held rates very low for obviously during the period of COVID, and now now re, uh, unwinding that. Looking at at when it's in Africa, things I was watching, you know, observing was infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, starting at the airports. You know, I come to all the airports. I went through four different airports. All of them were very clean. All of them very modern. Um, and and I always I always talk about New York. Um, the New York airports are going under renovation, but you know for yeah, a very long yeah. time you as as you know coming from I'd say somebody coming from another country at the first step into New York is going to be through the airport. And some of the airports were I seemed a little bit very dated and and and, and very, not, not what sure. you expected. So when I so so when I saw when I landed in the first airport and, and the, the three other ones, it was a complete night and day. And, and I know there probably was public private partnerships that were that renovated and developed the, the new, new buildings or the airport. Uh, I found the airline, uh, when we went between the two countries, we, we flew uh, Ethiopian Air, and, and that was a positive experience. You know, they did everything right. We had, um, you know, our first plane was an older plane, so I, you know, initially I said, okay, you know, that you have that perception of, oh, here's here's an older plane. I know this probably came came off the U.S. air, some big airline in the U.S. It's being released over and and later yeah. later thing, but then uh, that was only a short flight, and then the next two to we, as we go yeah. across the continent, we're very modern. I got the TV screens, and you know, <laughs> and it was night and day. Um, at one point, uh, you know, one of the airports, you know. We got delayed, and 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 while we were delayed, it wasn't the airline's fault. It was you know just timing of stuff, and you know, and but they they deboarded us. But shortly after that, they brought us back on and got to our next location. On you know, yeah, there's been vast there's been vast improvements in African infrastructure over the years, and uh, partly financed by the Chinese, but also the largest investors in in African infrastructure are African governments, and increasingly looking at it through a, a PPP structure. Um, Safiso, I'm sure GEPF uh, does some infrastructure in Southern Africa, um, but uh, are you, you know, in the 10% that you can invest outside, what asset classes are you looking at and are of interest? Um, so I'd say firstly, our, our investment strategy or the asset allocation, we, we lean heavily on, um, you know, the asset liability modeling that we do on a regular basis because that allows us to meet uh, long-term investment objectives and also um, be able to, to continue paying pensions um, and other benefits uh, with respect to the fund. So in terms of our asset um, uh, or, or investment strategy, we, we have a, a fairly sizable allocation towards uh, 
um, equity, right? Um, because it's a growth asset class and it allows us to outperform inflation over the long term and also uh, allows us access to, 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 to alpha. Another sizable allocation that we have exposure to is um, bonds, um, particular fusion or your fixed income and ILBs, because it allows us, um, um, it's a matching assets and it allows us to, to, to have liquidity to pay uh, pensions and other benefits. So in terms of private markets, so we do follow a number of themes. Um, the first is food security, um, FinTech and financial uh, uh, inclusion solution, um, water and sanitation solution, renewable energy solutions. And then um, what then happens is that we then partner with uh, uh, private equity funds on the continent, um, which basically are investing heavily in those uh, particular themes. Okay, yeah. So that's where uh, I would say our asset classes lie. So um, with regards to infrastructure, we there is a plan to, to start, uh, um, a particularly from a South African point of view, to have a deeper, you know, or, or encourage a, a, a lot of institutional investors, particularly pension funds, to start investing more in in, in infrastructure. And actually, uh, the regulation for most pension funds is uh, has been increased to to allow them to have more uh, 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 infrastructure exposure. For the GPF, our exposure is around um, between five to ten percent of our AUM in infrastructure. In terms of private equity, at the moment we're sitting at uh, not more than 10% uh, in, in terms of unlisted investments. Um, and obviously the aim is to do more because that's how um, we have found that you, you achieve more impact in terms of the investment. But that's that very make. high compared to other African uh, pension funds on the continent because say, for example, in Nigeria, Nigerian pension funds can have, um, uh, they, you know, they can have up to 5% allocation in say private equity but they have less than 1%, for example. And that's true in many other countries. So you guys have pushed way beyond that. Uh, Savisa, do you have a view on the emergence of private credit funds? That was one of the questions from our audience. Um, in terms of private credit, um, it depends on, I would say, the nature of the underlying project or the, the nature of the cash flows. Um, us being a pension fund, we tend to be leaning more on brownfield investments because of uh, uh, the cash flow profile, which is predictable and stable over a long period of time. Yes, got it. No, it, it's true. And this is the emerging, um, emerging space. Um, I had another question from the audience uh, to, I think, both Rhonda and Eric. Um, you know, what, what structures do your, your funds have or your platforms have for taking smaller uh, ticket sizes. So for example, I know that uh, one of the, the funds that Mita has invest or has engaged with for a very long time was the, um, uh, Chicago Teachers. And Chicago Teachers did an RFP process where they had a smaller ticket size when they made uh, their Africa, first Africa investment. Um, will you do the same or which mechanisms are you allowed to use to try to be innovative around ticket size? Maybe Rhonda, we can start with you. Well, ticket size is an issue for us, but we have done as small as five million before. Wow. Okay. Because the fund was actually small. We don't want to do more than you know 10%, 20%. And this was a smaller fund, but we had an opportunity to invest in a smaller fund. And that was a policy driven uh for the trustees. And so what we try to do with the trustees is also remember that. It's all around the portfolio structure, right? It's all around asset allocation. So when we're talking about risk, we, we, we minimize and maximize it based on our structure. And so we do do venture capital also. And usually those bites are smaller uh, yeah. on the venture capital side. So we will look at smaller funds, but we have to be very uh, specific because we can't do a lot of them. Yeah, true. But you have too few people, start. right? That's why yeah, it's right. resources. There's only so many folks and so many funds that we can invest in. But that doesn't mean we can't do any. And we right. have done it before. I hope Eric? that's the question. Well, I'd say, our, yeah, same with us. Um, you know, we're investing in probably large, at the moment, larger funds, but but we're pooling our money with many other institutional investors. So uh, at times I always say we're in very big funds, but we're a small, small piece of it. Um, other times, you know, as, as as you partner up with with other pension plans, whether it's U.S. or or African, 
you could create structures on and and work with the investment managers to create different vehicles, more of a fund to fund structure where yeah, a big US, big city, big state might make a big ticket investment, but then they know, okay, they might have a, a big investment in a in a in a larger fund, but within that fund, they're gonna make much smaller investments throughout different yeah. plans, different structures to get around, you know, that capital constraint. Um uh, many of many of the pension plans and institution investors do have within the investment policies restrictions. You can't have more than five or ten percent of a of your allocation into one flicker fund or or direct investment. Yeah, the concentration constraints are are a challenge. But unfortunately in the Africa private equity space, we really haven't seen the emergence of fund of funds. Um, for a variety of reasons, um, I've heard various things. One that DFIs uh, see the same funds that that same fund they see the same deal flow directly. They don't need the fund of funds to access the deal flow. Um, and others sometimes say that they um, you know don't want to pay the layers of fees. I don't know, Rhonda, you are shaking your head. Yes, I mean fund of funds. For those of us who've seen the structural disconnect, we've always turned to fund of funds as the idea. But when you just at this game a long time, you see that they failed to raise. So over time, you have to say maybe there's a challenge here. I mean, Rhonda, do you have anything to add? I was shaking my head because it, typically in Texas, or at least in Houston, we don't usually look at fund of fund. I guess yeah. it, so I've always, we've always waited out whether we're missing something, but we've been able to actually balance it out. And we typically do not do our fund of funds. Uh, because, but that is something that we do because of our philosophy in, in having separate funds. But I will say that there are a lot of fund of funds there and they've done well. It's just our strategy to, if we're gonna do a fund of funds, we create our own. We, we did that for our hedge fund uh, portfolio where we have smaller portfolios. And that's another one. We are uh, unique enough or progressive enough to say, hey, well, these are smaller bites. So let's yep. create a pool, call it our hedge funds, and it's the pool that may be 10 smaller bites, but it may represent 5% of the fund. So yep. we do look at things uh, differently, knowing that if we want to get in certain markets, we're going to have to look at things differently. Right. And so let's explore the concept. I see, Safi, so you want to come in, but I want to, and maybe this will bring you uh, in as well. Let's explore the concept of like partnerships helping out. And it's partnerships, you know, you being on this call with Safiso, for example, Yubsira, feel free to jump in. You know, there have been several questions in from our audience about, you know, is there appetite for U.S. institutional investors to partner with regional African DFIs? Um, you know, or, you know, is there a, a pres preference for intermediation from like, I don't know, an international investment bank or, and this is comes question comes from DBSA in, in South Africa, so Development Bank of South Africa. Um, I know that uh, TDB, Trade and Development Bank of East and Southern Africa, has been uh, engaging with MEDA. So, Yipsir, let's go come to you first and then Safiso on how these partnerships can really drive additional investment. Yes, um, like, well, like we've discussed, it, it is really structuring uh, right the right transactions so that it makes sense. The deals are responsive and in alignment with U.S. national investment objective and guidelines. That's very, very key. And there has been um, a lot of times that, like we said, the U.S. institutional investor tickets are, are much larger. So being responsive to that and being able to structure uh, a solution that, that, that is directly responsive, such as what we talked about, co-investments, where you know, um, a, a group of um, African um, allocators or institutional investors come together to bring that larger ticket size so U.S. Um, investors can, can invest in. Just to give you an example, recently there was a, a co-investment in the same African fun, a focus fund um, run by DPI. Um, and, and this fund has been able to attract U.S. and African institutional investors into, into the one fund. So that has been uh, one, that, that is a good example to really illustrate that really coming together from the, from the Africa side and from the U.S. And this partnership that has been created through direct exposure and education, like we said in the delegation trips, and to really share experiences and lessons learned in both sides to identify ways that, that we can kind of go over these hurdles or kind of um, humps that we've discussed to, that are hurdles to uh, U.S. and Australian investors to really allocate in the continent. And also to give opportunity um, for African pension funds 
to really take advantage of, of this, this real returns across the continent, investing alongside big ticket um, investors like the US. Uh, but it is really key that the PVP that, that we've seen, like you said, uh, African governments are really big investors in infrastructure, but also getting into the space of where you can collaborate with um, in the PP, PVP mechanism. We've done it in Kenya and we're doing it in South Africa as well to really make an impact in developmental projects such as infrastructures, real estate, affordable housing, and so on, which MEDA has been really taking an initiative and in, in crafting very innovative solutions. Great. Safiso, you want to come in? Yeah, no, I just wanted to comment on, on, the, on, on the ticket size issue and the fund of funds, right? So typically on our size, um, our, our general ticket size is, is around, I'll say, between 200 to 500 million rands, which probably translate to about uh, 20 to 30 million dollars in terms of ticket size. The leaning um, from our side, um, the GPF in terms of how it's structured, we, we, um, we have, uh, I'll say, a state-owned asset manager called the, the Public Investment Corporation or the PIC, mm -hmm. and they do more of, uh, of the investing on, on, for, in terms of our AUM. Um, and the leaning there mostly is to, to, to invest directly. Um, first of all, so I'll say probably 90% of the portfolio that is invested directly into entities. And then the remainder um, is through, I would say, a, a fund of fund program of sorts where they'll have um, an allocation towards other um, um, fund managers who are um, raising or, or, or raising funds. And another aspect that uh, is done, um, particularly from a fund to fund program within the South African context is, um, uh, is it's a concept in South Africa, we call it transformation or affirmative action. I think it's yeah, called- Yeah, the, the BEE effort. Yes, where you basically try to, to in, in, uh, empower or, or, or increase the participation of uh, a black uh, asset managers. So that's part of the program that's run by the PIC within a fund of funds programs where we allocate. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, and, and that's very similar to um, U.S. pension funds. And I'm sure Rhonda and Eric can talk about their emerging managers, because when you're trying to get more inclusivity in capital management and asset management, you need to address issues of how you help first time fund managers. Um, and so that's because, you know, many black and women fund managers in South Africa would be first time fund managers. So you have these mechanisms and I'm sure Rhonda and Eric do as well. Um, any comment, uh, Safiso, on partnerships and how you would think GEPF would think about partnering with uh, or co-investing with uh, U.S. pension funds? So we, I would say, on, on, on two levels. The first is we do participate in various industry bodies. So there's one um, that uh, I was mentioned uh, that's being organized by MEDA, which is the Asset Owners uh, Forum. So we basically sit on that forum. Um, the principal executive of the P of uh, the GPF is actually um, chairing that forum um, um, from, let's say, from last month. So we have a very strong and active participation there. And then secondly, in terms of the investments that we made, um, there was mention of DPI. We uh, have invested um, uh, and partnered with DPI, I think, on two of their funds, and that's mm -hmm. alongside with other international investors as well. So um, we do uh, invest directly ourselves, but also uh, participate with other uh, managers, um, both uh, internally and from outside the, the continent. Yeah. Okay, uh, Rhonda, any comments on uh, partnerships and what you would like to see or how could you more easily convince your fellow trustees to do Africa investments? So the concept of partnership is something that can be raised. So for me, the, the first thing is just to open the eyes, right? that this is a, an investment, that this is truly an investment and we can raise money and, and actually have a return. Just that simple idea. This is not a give or a program. Charity situation, yeah. <laughs> this is an investment and it's just another investment opportunity. And so right. that's the first step. And that first step is in twofold. It's also not only talking to the consultants, but it's also talking to the trustees. And we establish the policies and we establish how we're going to drive the investments from a bigger picture. And then it's the staff. So the first step, and it's a slow haul, 
because long in the world it's a journey right especially if it's new because we like what we like and it's worked for us but that doesn't mean that we can't integrate it with other opportunities and so the first step is to say hey this is another opportunity that can create investment return and that it's it's another population that we need to review and look at just like we did with private equity and private credit yeah and Rhonda, in that effort, I have a good a question for my good friend Charlie in, in the audience here. Um, what kind of research or, or you know, like tools can you have to help convince convince your colleagues or your consultants? You know, is it is it one page company reports or fund backgrounds? Is it five page thematic works? Is it a hundred page long sector deep dive? What do you think's missing? from like, you know, that could help get this in front and help this education gap? So to start it, it's just a matter of what's been invested in and what type of returns have been seen. So what okay. is that, how does that look globally? And then maybe some deep dives into a couple of the firms that are that really doing something. But initially for me, I need to go in and say, hey, look, somebody's been investing for, I'm just using, Somebody's been investing for 10 years and this is what the return has been, just to yeah. give a historical perspective. Good. So if there's something like that out there for initial discussions, it would be very helpful. Yep. And Eric, I'll turn to you on, on the same question on, um, well, partnerships, you already talked about partnering and syndication with other uh, US asset managers. Um, what about partnerships with uh, African entities or African DFIs? And then, you know, what do you need to help convince your other trustees or at least open uh, the dialogue with them? I mean, definitely partnerships is the way to go. You know, you have, you know, everybody does better when you work together. Um, we all bring, when you have a joint venture, everybody brings something unique to the partnership. Obviously, if you have African pension plans who are, they know, they know the countries, they know the, the network. Um, and, and while U.S. pension plans have a lot more money, you know, we, we invest so little into the continent, um, even emerging markets, you know, uh, uh, typical in the U.S., uh, U.S. institutional investors invest less than 5% of their allocation into emerging markets, which is very broad. Um, and then when we look at, obviously, specifically into the African continent, it's going to be less than 1%, which is, in and even, even when we look at our portfolios of emerging market funds to see how little, when I go through, you know, individually, which countries are making it up, it is so little of that bigger portfolio. Uh, that's a challenge. Um, and obviously, the more the more you partner with, you get more educated, you develop relationships, you know what, you share best practices with each other, um, you know, whether it's governance issues we might be doing or, or other, or, go, or learning from, from our counterparts, you know, what's going on and how to look at things. And part of it's educating, you know, not just the consultants, our boards, but our whole industry. Um, many times we go to these, I go to these conferences and, and Africa is never brought up on an emerging market panel or, or an asset class. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, over time we're going to change this, uh, get more, more visibility. And as, as, as uh, the demographics of our boards change, as we make our boards more diversified at, at the pension level, at the institutional level, our, when we start looking at our own employees who and retirees who were serving and you realize that we have very diversified for sure. uh, membership and and we we're not making investments that reflect that you know we invest globally yet we focus on certain regions and they might be you know and we don't do the research to look at the that growth opportunity so just building on that and, and here i want to bring you in i mean what are we doing to educate the pension consultants are they coming on meta trips um, you know, are, is it you, Eric, who's telling the consultants they need to get educated? I mean, because at the end of the day, you're clients. So if you tell your consultants that they need to get educated, maybe they'll listen. So just what's being done uh, to kind of raise the level of, of the pension consultants awareness of African opportunities? Yes, Ari, it's very, very important. Um, and we, we've had uh, consultants being part of our advisory council, the, the NASP MEDA um, uh, an Institutional Investors Advisory Council, uh, and they've been part of our trips before. And like you said, it's very critical to, to really engage the U.S. Institutional Investors to also include consultants. 
Um, and you very well know NASP, the National Security Professionals Association, um, has a, a, a large number of consultants that are our members, and they do engage their consultants in different programming. So we collaborate with NASP to really get the research, the data, and the exposure of the continent and what we've been doing to the consultant community here because we, we do think it's important. And, and on the research and education, besides the delegation trips and being on the ground, we collaborate with leading institutions such as Mercer to really pr bring together um, a, a very well thought out deep dive research on why Africa, the real and perceived risks of investing in Africa. That research have been done in 2018 and then a follow up has been done in 2022. Uh, so we continue to follow up um, and bring research, real data uh, to really educate and inform the US institutional investor community. And on top of that, we just uh, also did a collaborative research and survey with leading financial institutions of the US and Africa, such as BNY Mellon and Standard Bank, that's called uh, the World to Africa, uh, really surveying actual institutional investors who have allocated who are thinking about allocating, why they are not looking at Africa, what they are looking for Africa. So all of that uh, data and statistics have been really eye-opening and informing our institutional investor community here. Um, and also like Rhonda said, we need champions, right? Uh, folks that are really telling the why Africa story and it, that it has a real return um, significance to it. Why Africa is not about charity, why Africa is not about just giving out, but it's an actual investment relationship and actual returns that are being realized by institutions. And Yipsir, I'll encourage you to put in the chat maybe some links to those reports for our participants. Um, some are talking about the NASP annual conference. You know, how can people get involved? So please use the chat for that function and, and sure. maybe how they can reach you, et cetera. Uh, sure. Eric, did you have anything to add on um, the consultant piece? Yeah, um, part of it is, you know, is that education and, and yeah, as institutional investors, trustees, we got, we got to do our part to, to get them to look at that, to bring it, you know, to get educated themselves and, 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 and find a network and, and whether it's introducing our own networks that we're developing with, with these, with these partnerships, where, whether relationships, informal or formal. Another thing, you know, two years ago, three years ago, we wouldn't be having these Zoom conferences online, we'd be having Zoom roundtables where you, you could quickly hop on for an hour with people around the world in, in from yeah. different parts. You have government officials, you have pension plans, you have family offices, and as well as consultants for an hour during lunch or some other time to discuss different topics. It's so true. Um, and so now we have this, you know, new way of communicating where these barriers are now coming down. Previously, I'd meet with somebody in New York City if they were happening to be at a conference and to expect Somebody in, uh, somebody in South Africa or on the African continent to, to get in, that in touch with me was going to be in person at that conference it would not necessarily happen. Now it's easier to connect, schedule, we schedule a Zoom call and you get educated what we do, how we operate and vice versa. I learned, I've passed two, two and a half years, I learned quite a bit more just by connecting the people on the continent um, in there, in the different countries, how they operate and, and, and building out the network that way. Yeah, I think we're getting to a new normal. Uh, honestly, us at the Atlantic Council have been reflecting on this as well. I mean, Zoom, you know, you, you can reach a broader, more democratic audience. I mean, we used to always have to wait till ministers or African business leaders came to Washington to host them. Now we can do this and reach an African audience in a bigger way because they weren't in Washington to be in those private rooms. Um, that said, you know, we all know that the human relationships you make in person are, are stronger over time. And so it's, we're getting to a new balance, I think. But you know, with our last few minutes, I want to turn to you, Sophie, so to get your thoughts on two forces that we're seeing, and they're happening simultaneous. One, we're in a, um, uh, a, a market environment right now, which you know, right now the, the stock market's gone down longer than it did in 2008. Um, you know, definitely bear market territory, if not uh, recession talk. Um, and so there will be a higher interest rate environment. How will that change the investment uh, that GEPF makes and expects into the region? Secondly, we have a big focus on climate and in green investing, right? We're going to have trillions eventually going to climate investing. Um, we know in African markets have the opportunity for 
uh, investment in, of course, adaptation, but also, you know, becoming large carbon sinks, things of this sort. Uh, so how do you see those two forces playing out? Uh, how does GEPF think about it? And how do you think about it in terms of inflows to, into the continent? No, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So because what, what tends to happen is that, you know, when you have Fed policy changes, everyone on the emerging market, uh, all our central bankers then tend to follow. So we've also had a, another tightening um, um, policy on our end and it's affected our equity market quite substantially. In fact, our, our, our listed portfolio from an equity side did take a, a bit of a knock because of that. Obviously, there's a whole lot of risk off sentiment that affects us um, uh, because of, of, of the policy. So in terms of how it affects our strategy, generally, we, we take the long view. Um, as, as referred earlier on, we've got our strategic asset allocation that we follow. And um, bar any other, I'd say, significant events such as a COVID uh, a market dislocation like that, um, we follow that, that the the those allocations so there's i would say literally no change that will be um, um, um applied in our policy uh, uh in terms of the asset allocation that is um so in terms of uh then the second uh aspect of the question um around climate change or sustainability in general um we do take a strong view towards um a sustainability in investing right so our policy generally is uh, to be concerned about um, the financial returns and pensions that uh, our members will get, but also the environment that they'll get that pension in because um, it affects the real value of the money. So if you're getting uh, an amount and there's no road, there's no infrastructure, it actually erodes the actual amount that, that, you, that you're getting from the fund. So we do take, um, a, a, say in the past weekend, for example, um, we, we launched a wind farm um, in the Northern Cape, um, for example, um, and that will be generating um, or powering at least around 50,000 households per year. So we are making um, slow strides um, um, and investing in, 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 in line with uh, a, a, an ESG and impact angle from our perspective. And uh, uh, we, for example, um, uh, uh, follow and, uh, and uh, uh, signatories of UNPRI, and we have an A rating. So our investment strategy um, um, does have a very strong ESG footprint. Yep. So Eric, can I turn to you on to reflect on those two forces as we uh, wrap up? Sure. Now ESG is very very critical for us um, and, and many many global in institutional investors. Um, you know, we've got to address the climate issue both and it's going to impact everybody whether you're in, in a in a on, on, on a coastal community or you're in inland you're going to have these impacts are going to disrupt and cause huge losses if we don't address them over you know start addressing them. uh other things i i'd like to say is you know you continue to make this investment it builds uh you build roads you, you build housing and all of a sudden you're going to get businesses in, in in those communities and as those businesses make money they're employing people local people and who are going to get higher wages they're going to have improved the education and everybody rises as we work together especially especially in the emerging markets um and then you have the cross pollination of you know many times you know you you have you have had classmates in, in, in classes who came from africa and and they you know some stay in the u.s some go back and because they're they they want to elevate, develop their own, their country, which is huge. Um, and and, and you, in, in retrospect, and even even going back to that, you know, the whole telecommuting or or remote learning, you know, no longer you have to be in in that location. Everybody, you know, educational systems are all going going using hybrid and remote, where where I have classmates in different different parts of Africa logging in. It might be the middle of the night for them, uh, and it's a night, you know, relatively, but that's huge because not only you gain, you're connecting with them, you're developing relationships, you're working with them on, on different projects, even though you might end up in different places, you, you're developing these relationships. So when it goes back to, you know, some of own, you know, who do I need to work with? Who should I be contacting? It's like, you all, you, you know people, you have these relationships and, yep. and they can introduce in as well as many other organizations. So. 
How do you see market pressure though um, with uh, kind of, you see a retreat to quality, you see um, uh, kind of a conservatism setting in as people pause things. I'm sure pension funds are pausing their venture investments right now. I mean, how do you think that will impact new strategies in Africa? I think it's, it's going to be challenging because as, as you know, large institutional investors globally have, will be taking probably some write downs and, and short term impacts from, from the market. So uh, for us as a government, we have to report once a year. Our, our year end is June 30th. So, you know, while we had a great year last year, you know, this year isn't going to be as well. And, and that's going to put more pressure on us. Okay, look, reevaluating our asset allocation. Uh, even though yeah. we, we should be at, you know, you're down, you should be, you know, making different investments. To buy, it's growth. a good time to buy. Yeah, exactly. And into the growth, into the growth story, um, you know, Developed, developed nations are, aren't growing the GDP as rapidly as many of the African countries. Many of them are over 5% growth. And when and, they, and, and we talk about uncorrelated assets or allocation, while, while at times, you know, you have, everybody goes in the same direction, you recover much rapidly in other, other areas much rapidly and yeah. at different cycles. And everybody forgets that when, when they say, oh, our portfolio is down, we, we're not going to go into these new areas. That's when you should be going in. There might be not... Uh, valuation discounts that you're going to get high quality companies, good management teams, growing organizations, and and uh, uh, rising middle class who's going to end up buying the product. Who as everybody improves, society improves, you, they're going to buy more and and go from you know making uh, a widget to something more advanced. And and uh, yeah. as we say at one point, you know, the U.S. was was a frontier country, and and and, and look at you know my own. Family as they came here, they start off in one spot, and over generate over time, the next layer does much better than the previous one. Yeah, I know. I I very much agree with um, that. Now is the time to look at it, and I think that all too often we tell the growth story around African markets. I mean, you always hear the you know six of ten fastest growing countries kind of statistic, but I think sometimes we fail to tell the diversification benefit story. As, as greatly and with global asset managers, um, that's what they, you know, that often can be more persuasive. So I'm glad you kind of brought us back to that element. And, you know, I want to wrap us up today to say that, you know, I am dedicated, I've dedicated my entire career to breaking down these, these four obstacles, the data issues, the network problems, the structural disconnect and the lack of visibility in a variety of platforms. Um, and we at the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council remain committed to this with our partners, um, whether they be Meta on this event or uh, TDB and others. Um, and we look for more partnerships that can do that. So um, it's really uh, the beginning of a conversation that's ongoing. Uh, we're doing an investor series, insights from investors, investor insights that I'll do different interviews with uh, asset managers globally, whether they be African or uh, US, uh, European, et cetera, uh, really to get perspectives on why um, certain asset classes make sense, why, um, why opportunities uh, are being uh, seized or not seized, and just really strategies for successful investment in the region. Um, so let me thank everyone, uh, invite you to check out future Africa Center events. Um, and to you know, just say Happy Africa Day. I know it's one day late. Uh, yesterday was Africa Day, but uh, still Happy Afri Africa Day to everyone. And thank you for tuning in. It's a real pleasure.